Welcome. Thank you so much for coming to our presentation. Feel free to move to the middle or forward if you would like. Uh, my name is Dr. Kim Smith, and I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Schools, and I uh, welcome you to this presentation this evening. Um, let me just tell you very quickly the, the objective of the presentation and our agenda and how it will proceed, uh, and then we'll get right to the, uh, to the Common Core presentation. So the idea of this evening is, is hopefully to answer a lot of your questions that you might have as parents or community members about the Common Core standards. What are they? Uh, to help kind of unpack them and help you understand uh, what the Common Core standards are in ELA and math. And, uh, and even more importantly, to maybe get a little bit of an inside look of what they look like in the classroom in practice. So I'm so pleased to have with me some guests here tonight. We have Liz McDonald from the Boston Public Schools. She's probably still en route. We were going to do ELA first, but she's not here yet, so we'll start with math, and then we'll go to ELA. Uh, we also have Wendy Phillips, our 5 through 12 math curriculum coordinator. Kristen McBurdy, a fourth grade teacher for the Wakefield Public Schools, and Erin Roy, an eighth grade teacher for the Wakefield Public Schools, joining us to talk to you a little bit about uh, what happens in the classrooms. I'd also like to just uh, mention that all of our district principals are here, uh, representing every school, and you'll have a chance to interact with them later as well. So thank you so much to our principals um, for being here this evening. So first, uh, I'd like to introduce to you the superintendent of schools, Dr. Stephen Zurich. Good evening, everybody. Um, tonight, tonight's uh, presentation is, is a truly exciting one for me. Um, we've done a lot of work in this district in preparing for what are now uh, three-year-old standards. Uh, a lot of people think the Common Core arrived um, on our doorstep in the last year, but in fact, since 2011, they've been part of the Massachusetts frameworks uh, for education. And um, we are, I feel like as a district, we've put a lot of things in place in the last a few years to prepare ourselves for this monumental shift in uh, teaching practice. Um, I, tonight's purpose is not, I'm not here, we're not here to sell you on the standards, whether they're better or worse, but it's really, as Dr. Smith said, to really give you an inside look to what it, um, what it looks like in our, in our schools and the, and the steps we're taking to support your children, and then uh, for you to learn about ways that you can um, also provide assistance to your children at home around uh, the standards. Part of, one of the uh, important parts of our um, strategic plan is about engagement and engagement, engaging families. And it's not just engagement so that everybody feels, uh, you know, has a good time at a family night at a school. That's wonderful, and I know you all have, you like the Halloween parties and different social events at school. But part of what true engagement is, is around academics and around teaching and learning. And we have to do a better job as a school system of providing parents the opportunity to learn, um, you know, how to best support their children. Uh, there's no way we can do this work alone, and, we, and frankly, many school systems, I, I find, in my experience, have not done enough to empower parents, give um, our families, not just parents, but families, community members, um, in, you know, insight in uh, what they can do to accelerate the work that we do in the school. And often it's a mystery. Even, even as an educator, I'm confused by all the lingo and the changes, it changes every day. So I can imagine, as someone that's not, uh, many of you who are not educators, how difficult it is to really understand the, the shifts that are happening in our schools. And I will say that what we're seeing now in public schools is one of the most significant shifts of the last 20 years. And having been, I think this is maybe my 17th year in education, uh, this is, uh, other, other than the MCAS being introduced, um, this, is, uh, this is the next, major um, shift in our practice and has huge implications for the work we do every day um, in schools. So I hope tonight's an informative session. I hope that this is the first of, over the next few years, multiple opportunities to interact with you, that this not just happened at the district level, but also at the school level. And you know, we, we hope we get some feedback from you throughout the night of other ways that we can continue to keep you involved in this conversation, engage with you, as the Common Core um, standards uh, come alive in our schools. So thank you for being here tonight, and I, we look forward to uh, uh, presenting um, I, what we think is some valuable information. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Drake. So the uh, agenda for this evening will be, for the first hour from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock, we'd like to present you with some information on ELA and math. We'll talk about the standards, we'll talk about what they look like in practice, and we'll hear from some of the teachers, and you'll even have a chance to engage in an activity or two yourself so that you get a little 
practice and uh, kind of see what it feels like. Uh, and then we want to make sure that we leave time for you to have an opportunity to ask questions and do a question and answer session and maybe even to discuss things a little bit further. And we thought the best way to do that is uh, when we're done with our one hour presentation, we'll do a breakout uh, session into the small cafeteria and you'll see that we're spread out there and uh, the district principals will also spread out and we'll give you a chance to sit in small groups and ask any questions that are on your mind. Uh, maybe talk through some things and have a, dis and have a discussion, have an opportunity for you to have any conversations that you'd like to have at that time. So without further ado, we'll begin the presentation, as I said, with math, and I'd like to introduce to you uh, Wendy Phillips, our grades 5 through 12 math curriculum coordinator. Good evening. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about the math standards. Um, so the math the Massachusetts curriculum frameworks cover pre-K through 12th grade, and there's really two major components that I'll be talking about tonight. The first is what's called the content standards, that's the content that we actually teach to students, and the second is the, really the, the new and exciting part of the standards, they're called the practice standards. And uh, just to kind of clarify, so the Massachusetts uh, standards incorporate the common core state standards. There are certain, some small changes that Massachusetts has made and actually the pre-K standards is one of those changes. Next slide, please. So the standards are research and evidence-based. They are aligned with college and work expectations. The committees that came up with the Common Core Standards incorporated not only public school educators, but also college-level educators, um, people from the, the business world, and um, parents as well. They are rigorous and they are also internationally benchmarked. Next slide, please. So the content standards, this covers the pre-K through eight standards. Um, they are broken into domains, and you can see the, the shading <coughs> kind of shows up there. Um, the shading shows that the um, progressions that have been defined with it. So one of the changes is that there's a much greater focus at each grade level, exactly what needs to be taught, and a real attention paid to the, the coherence that there's a, a purposeful sequence through the grades so that all skills are building on future skills. One of the things that's changed in the, the new standards, the 2011 standards, is that there are fluency skills now defined. So at particular grade levels, they defined what students need to be fluent in as well as um, specifying that standards eventually, students, I'm sorry, eventually need to understand standard algorithms. So that's something that's new with these standards that wasn't specified in the previous standards. Next slide, please. The high school standards, rather than have domains, they have what are called conceptual categories. So those are listed up the top. And those conceptual categories are scattered throughout the courses that are offered at the high school. Um, the Wakefield Public Schools are following what's called the model traditional pathway, which um, specifies a sequence of Algebra 1 to Geometry to Algebra 2. Next slide, please. So this is where I'm going to spend the major por portion of my presentation, because this is where the, the math practices come in. And this is what, what really makes math class look a little different these days. Um, I've incorporated throughout it some videos to give you a, just kind of a glimpse into the classroom of what some of these standards might look like. So the first standard, make sense of problems and persevere in solving them. Um, basically that's talking about rather than just a student having a formula and just jumping into it and solving it, not really understanding what they're doing, they, uh, they kind of come up with a plan for solving it. Um, for younger students, they use concrete objects or pictures to help them organize and solve a problem, and they continually ask themselves, does this make sense? So the video you're going to see is actually of a first grade classroom. They were practicing addition using different concrete models. So if you could just click on that video, please. <laughs> Yeah. 
I love the little boy with the three. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> um, so the second practice standard is that students will be able to reason abstractly and quantitatively. And um, basically what that means is they need to make sense of the quantities uh, and the relationships between the quantities and their problem solving. Standard practice standard three is to construct viable arguments and critique the reasoning of others. Uh, they justify the conclusions, communicate them to others, and respond to the arguments of others. So this video clip is going to show you a seventh grade class. They were learning to model addition of integers using chips, red and black chips. So if you what if we add in like another eight? If we add another eight, ten is eight. How would that work? That wouldn't work because if this is eight and then you add the minus four, it would be four. Yeah, you're right. So what we need to do is we need to add like another four red chips. So then if we have four chips, then we're going to add Um, practice standard four model, model with mathematics. Um, uh, students apply the mathematics they know to solve problems arising in everyday life, society, and the workplace. So this video clip we're going to see an eighth grade class beginning to learn about the slope of a line and relating it to the steepness of stairs. Um, the audio on this is a little bit light at the beginning, so I will tell you the first student is talking about the stairs at the old Galvin compared to the new Galvin. And then the second student is talking about the stairs at the BB library. These are like this big and you're barely making any progress. And I just, the stairs at the other guy I would do, I would give you way more room for your feet, but I didn't want to pick up. All right. I just like it better. Okay, so you think I would need more room for your feet on the old stairs, but now you don't have to go up as much, right? Okay. Students will use appropriate tools strategically. Those tools in court um, are paper and pencil, compasses, protractors, uh, calculators, computers. Um, the students need to be able to consider what's available in the situation and um, also use tools to deepen their understanding. So this video is going to show you a high school geometry class using their devices to um, draw Parallel lines, I believe, is what they're doing. Standard number six, attend precision. Uh, students need to communicate precisely to others. That includes using vocabulary as well as the, um, their numbers. They need to express their numerical answers with a degree of precision that's appropriate for the problem context. This is just going to go back to that stair activity where a couple of students were kind of questioning each other on how accurate their measurements are. So, uh, 
All right, and then the last two, number seven is look for and make use of structure. Um, students are encouraged to look closely and look for patterns or structure in the work that they do. And number eight is to look for and express regularity and repeated reasoning. So noticing when calculations repeat and look for general methods and shortcuts for the work that they're doing. I am now going to turn it over to Kristen Liberti, who's going to take you through an elementary math lesson. Um, and like Wendy said, I'm going to walk you through what a previous lesson looked like um, when we were using everyday math. And I'm currently um, using Envision Math in my classroom, so what that looks like um, as well. So first thing, the curriculum that we used before was something called a spiral curriculum. Um, and this was a curriculum where learning is spread out over time. Um, rather than being concentrated in shorter time periods. Um, material is revisited repeatedly over months and across grades. Um, and mastery is not necessarily expected right away. Um, the reason why mastery is not expected is because um, when it's first introduced, because they would be revisiting the concept again and again. Um, with Envision Math, um, oh, sorry. Um, with everyday math, we started with a math message. This was a type of question that would um, the, the students could solve easily, um, and it would get them thinking about the concept that was going to be reviewed in the lesson. Then the teacher would do explicit teaching in the lesson. Um, we would give them all the information that they would need to solve the problem up front. We would go over um, several examples um, with them before they got to actually do any of it on their own. Then we would go through a little bit of guided practice where students would be solving the questions with us. Um, and then they would move into independent work once the teacher decided that you know, they had um, full understanding of the concept. Uh, then at the end of class, the same homework would be given to every student. Um, with Envision Math, things look a little different. Um, we, it, when we introduce the concept that we're teaching, um, the first thing that we do is we set the purpose. What is the purpose of this lesson? Um, it's really important for the students to know what the purpose is, why they're learning this, and it engages them in the activities that they're going to be doing. After we set the purpose, um, teachers somehow make a connection with the kids, ask them questions, um, get them thinking about how they do um, math in, in their real lives, like going to the grocery store and estimating how much they think their bill is going to cost. Um, after we have engaged the students in the concept that we're going to be talking about, we, put, we propose another problem, which is somewhat like the math message that we use in everyday math, um, except this one's a little bit more challenging. And we don't give them anything at the beginning to help them solve it. They need to take what they know um, and try to come up with a way to solve the problem. Sometimes this is done individually, and sometimes this is done um, in small groups. There's always different ways to come to an answer. So just because Susie does it one way and Tommy does it another way, as long as they're both getting the right answer um, and they can explain their thinking, that's what we're really looking for there. Um, after students, um, students are always encouraged to share their strategies. Like in my class, we're called math masters and they come up to the, the front of the room and they can write on the board and show their friends um, how they solve the answer and it kind of makes them feel important and special and that they can show their friends how to do something. Um, and then after we share how they got their answers, um, teachers will then facilitate classroom discussions about the math of the activity and this is where the explicit, explicit teaching is, already, is being done. So you're doing the teaching after students 
have already had the, the chance to go through a problem on their own and solve it on their own. Um, within vision math, they have something called visual learning. So after the teacher does explicit learning, there's two um, forms of visual learning. It helps students um, focus on the key concepts of the lessons while highlighting connections among different parts of the concept. Um, for each uh, lesson, there is an animation or a video that goes along with it. And the kids love these. Um, they cannot wait every day. They're like, oh, when are we going to watch the video? When are we going to watch the video? <laughs> so it just, it's, it's a visually engaging way for students to understand the concept. Um, basically, what the video does, it, it reteaches them in, another, in other words that what I just taught them. Um, and during these videos, there's specific stop times. So there's times for think time. It might ask them another question. Um, it gives us uh, the opportunity to jump in and help the kids if we see that they're struggling with something. Um, and it gives them, it promotes a deeper understanding for, the, um, for these concepts. Once the visual learning is done, we move into guided practice. Um, guided practice is done with the teacher and it helps um, for the teacher to see, again, who's understanding the concept and who might need a little bit more intervention. Um, so when we do move into independent practice, in my classroom, I don't know if it works like this in every classroom, um, I might pull a small group of kids that might be struggling with the concept, um, and other kids might be working in groups, some people might be working independently, just depends on the day. Um, and then after the independent practice, that really, is, helps the kids get a solid understanding about the concept that be, is being taught, there's always problem solving. And these problem solving questions are mostly word problems um, and as we, uh, about word problems that have to do with the mathematical practices that Wendy was talking about. Um, then there's a close for each. We close the lesson where there's a quick check. Um, and in these quick check, it's always a way for students to explain their thinking about the concept, and this is another way for teachers just to check in daily to see who's understanding it and who's not, um, and where we might need some intervention. There's differentiated instruction built into every lesson. Um, so if kids are working in small groups, I could be pulling an intervention group, and there's actually centers for each lesson as well, pre-made centers that um, provide enrichment for the kids that don't necessarily need that intervention. And then a cool thing about Envision, or at least I think it's cool, um, is there's leveled homework. So for the kids that you know that got it and they don't need to practice their subtraction facts for the hundredth time, I can give them an enrichment homework that goes with the lesson. Or if I know there's kids that are still struggling, I can give them um, the intervention or the I think it's called the reteaching sheet that um, they can go over as well. So that's what that looks like in my classroom. And so I would like to introduce Erin Roy. Hi, I'm Erin Roy. I'm one of the eighth grade math teachers at the Galvin. And I'm so excited to see so many people here because that really shows your investment in the Wakefield Public Schools teaching and learning. So I'm going to go through part of what an actual lesson might look like, especially at the 8th grade level. This is an 8th grade lesson about solving equations. So we're going to take a look at the first slide. You are going to have to do a little work. And so if you want to go to the slides that were printed out that go with this, it's the single sheet that shows the six slides. We want to make sure we are making it accessible for all learners so we have the paper and visual copy in front of you. But if you are comfortable just looking up the PowerPoint, that's fine too. But you will need to do a little work, and I would really love it if you would um, talk to someone who's near you about this first problem. Next slide. There we go. Okay, so my question is how many blocks are in each bag? And to cut off anybody who wants to be facetious about the weight of the bags, assume they are weightless bags. Okay? But if you can figure out how many blocks are in each bag, 
and share your answer with a neighbor. Make sure you can justify your response. making sure that I give appropriate wait time. So if you could show me a zero if you're done, thumbs up if you need 30 seconds, or a one if you need a minute. Okay, let's take about 30 seconds and try and figure it out. It's okay if we hear lively chatter in the room. <laughs>
Show me a zero if you're done. Thumbs up if you need 30 seconds. A one if you need a minute. I need a little more feedback to make the decision. <laughs> beforehand, it's really nice that they jump right into solving multi-step equations as opposed to just starting with 2x equals 4 and then stepping it up like 2x plus 1 equals 7. And kind of just going through the rote memorization of going backwards, they are conceptually understanding that whatever you do to one side, you have to do to the other and that you have to keep it balanced or equal. And so in this case, so it's fractional answers because we say, let's say the blocks are made of clay. They're easy to cut into pieces. And then I have the right equation for this balance puzzle. And they follow the steps. And a lot of the students get to a point where they have an uneven number of blocks for the bags. Let's say, for example, five blocks for two bags. And they, so I say, okay, what's, they say first, usually no answer. There is no answer. You can't split them up. I'm like, well, let's be fair now. Look at five cookies. And there were five of them, you want to split them with me. Are you trying to say not we should have cookies at all? But no, 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 no. Where's the cookies? Give me the cookies. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, if there are two of us and there are five cookies, tell me how much we're gonna get. Two and a half. They know it when it comes to cookies. They know we'll split the last cookie. They usually try and convince me that they should get the third cookie. And I say that's fine as long as you can solve the equation. So then they look at the number of blocks and we talk about how you can cut up the blocks and split them evenly into the bags that fractional answers are okay, and that it may not make sense, 
with bags and blocks, but that's why we eventually have to go away from it. But the really nice part about starting this way again is the conceptual understanding of what it means for things to be equal. And so how we go from here is we switch just to equations. For students who continue to struggle, I usually have them draw a picture on the side. We do eventually have to include negatives and subtraction in general, so that sometimes can throw students for a loop. But usually I say, when you crossed off bags, there was a plus sign, and what did you do? You subtracted. What do you know about those two operations? Okay, they're inverse operations. So if you see subtraction, what should you do? You should add. And usually they're okay with it at that point to be able to move forward with just the equation. And then we go a little bit more, next slide please, into error analysis. Showing them someone else's work and having them find the mistake. So take a moment with your neighbors and see if you can find Gary's mistake in his work because he does not have the right answer to this equation. Anybody find Gary's mistake? mistake. It says 2x minus 4 equals 8. And what did Gary do? He also did minus 4. And so actually that would put you further in the red. But he kept going. And he got an answer at the end, so great, he must have done something, right? But he doesn't have the right answer. And so that's why before, when I emphasize taking your answer and plugging it back into your equation, we really emphasize checking, self-checking, and looking for mistakes. Not only so that it will help them when they're being assessed, but also, this is a real life skill, error analysis. One of my roommates from college works for Sikorsky, and that's her job, is looking at what went wrong with the helicopters and how they can fix it. And so having the error analysis skills starting now, having them look for things that might not be right, I mean, it came out of a helicopter, but something still wasn't working right. You got an answer, but it's not right. So going back and being able to evaluate, solve, check your work, are all skills that we really emphasize with this unit. And I personally am a huge fan of how this teaches equations because I often find that for traditional algebra, it's memorizing how you do things. And the second you're thrown a twist in the equation, you have no idea what to do. And so I really love the idea of the conceptual understanding that is brought on by a lesson like this through Come Court. Any questions? Okay, thanks. And here's Dr. Thank you. So I'm struck by two things. One, how wonderful would it be to have Kristen or Erin or Wendy as a teacher for your time? Um, but with the time for two things really jump out at me. It's, it's that conceptual understanding and it's inquiry-based learning. There's a lot of the students exploring and learning uh, on their own rather than just the direct instruction like they talked about so eloquently. Um, before we switch to ELA, just two points I want to make. One is on the agenda uh, that was handed out to you if you picked it out at the front table. Um, I did have a parent email me this week in light of this uh, conversation and said, is there a place where parents can look at great specific help for their child? So I just wanted to let you know that I put on the uh, bottom of the agenda that you can uh, take a look at if you would like on the, um, on the Wakefield Public Schools uh, District webpage. Uh, there is a section under uh, academics, and that drop-down menu is um, um, the WPS curriculum page, web page. And on that, you can find Common Core Parent Roadmaps, and that's for ELA and in math, and it gives you a roadmap to every grade level in ELA and math. So you, some of you might find that helpful as well. Today we talked about grade four, grade eight. You saw some videotapes from our first grade classrooms and high school classrooms, but you might want to look at a grade-specific um, uh, age. Uh, I also just want to say that I'm uh, so pleased to see three members of our school committee with us here today. Uh, Ann Danahy is here. Welcome, Ann. Where, where did Ann go? She was here somewhere. <laughs> Ann, there she is. And Greg Liegos is here. And uh, I just saw Evan Kenny here as well. So thank you so much for coming and supporting us today. 
So now we will uh, head on to English language arts for the second half of the presentation. And I'd like to introduce to you Liz McDonald from the Boston Public Schools. She'll tell you a bit about herself, but we're so lucky to have had her as a consultant as we started making the shift in the Wakefield Public Schools. We need a lot of training and development for teachers, and uh, she has just been a fantastic resource for us. So I thought I would bring her along to uh, help us out with this presentation tonight. So Liz McDonald from the Boston Public Schools. Um, as Kim said, I'm here today to present an overview of the Common Core State Standards. Um, I've been asked to speak based on my experience with the standards and also the work that I've done here with the administrators, teachers, and literacy coaches in Wakefield. So who am I? I um, am an educator in Boston Public Schools. I've worked in the BPS for 20 years. Um, I was a classroom teacher. I'm now a literacy coach. And I also have worked in higher ed at Boston College as adjunct faculty for the last 12 years. When we talk about the Common Core Standards, I'm here to share my experience both as a teacher and a coach. So when I started to teach, there were no standards. There were no mass curriculum frameworks. I then, as a fourth grade teacher, saw the adoption of the mass curriculum frameworks. And I worked with those frameworks as a teacher. Then as a coach, with the adoption of the Common Core State Standards, I worked with both administrators and teachers with the implementation of the Common Core State Standards. I can say that both as a teacher and as a person working with school leaders and working with teachers and coaches, I can tell you that standards are an essential guide for curriculum planning, and for setting expectations for all students. So what we're going to do tonight, and I'm gonna, oh, gonna move back for a minute. Sorry, I'm used to having my clicker. What I wanna talk to tonight, the goal for tonight is for me just to share with you the shifts of the literacy standards, to tell you how the standards are organized, and then we're going to transition to see how the standards are connected to curriculum. After that, you'll hear from me again, and I'm going to show you an example of the new PARC assessment that will be taking place this year, replacing the MCAS. We're going to look at one particular question on that assessment, and we're going to trace the standards to see the progression of standards from kindergarten up through eighth grade. Um, we can look further as well, but we're going to hone in on K to 8, um, and I'll give you the standard number so you can move on and look at the other um, grade levels. Next slide, slide, please. So in 2010, the Common Core State Standards were drafted. Massachusetts adopted them in 2011. At this point, many of their states have adopted the standards. When we talk about the Common Core State Standards, we can move on. We talk about these shifts. So David Coleman and Sue Pimentel, who we're gonna see in a video clip in just a few minutes, who were two of the authors of the Common Core State Standards. That's a lot to wrap my, you know, I used to say in CCSS. Um, they will say, and they have shared, that when they created and wrote the Common Core State Standards, they leaned on those states that had the most rigorous standards. Massachusetts was one of those states. So for us here in Massachusetts, some of these shifts that we talk about nationally will not seem like such a huge shift. That being said, however, there were some trends that were happening nationwide and here in Massachusetts that needed to be addressed with the Common Core State Standards. Some of those trends were that we were finding through research, through looking at the text that we were using in schools, that despite the fact that we were not lowering the text expectation in college and in the workplace, the expectation, the level of text complexity was finding this downward trend in complexity in our schools K-12. Another trend that was happening is that we were moving outside of the text a lot. We were doing a lot of work with students asking questions 
that didn't that didn't rely on them having to go back into the text. So there was this trend of moving outside the text. And finally, what was happening, and some of this was due to state testing, is we were narrowing the type of writing we were asking students to do. So we were narrowing our writing a lot to narrative writing. So when we look at these shifts, these are the shifts from the previous standards to the current standards. These are the things we want to hone in on. We want to make sure that students have, at the elementary level, a 50-50 balance between nonfiction text and literature. When we move up in the grades, by the time we get to high school, we're moving to a 70-30 shift, an 80-20, meaning relying more heavily on nonfiction text. We also want to make sure that we are using complex text in the classroom. Finally, we want to make sure when we're asking students to speak and write about text, that it's grounded in evidence from the text. Okay, we can move on. When we talk about the organization, one more, thanks, um, of the Common Core State Standards, the Common Core State Standards start with these anchor standards. So the anchor standards are the guiding standards that then dictate the grade level standards. So K to 5, 6 to 12 have anchor standards. From those anchor standards, you will have specific 6th grade level standards, specific 8th grade level standards. We'll move on one more. When we talk about the standards, we have them organized pre-K to 5, Pre-K is a standard that Massachusetts added. Each state had the option to add 15% of their own standards to the national standards. Massachusetts added in pre-K standards, which didn't exist in the national standards, and a few other standards that they felt needed to be added in. We then have six to 12 English language arts standards, and then, we also have 6 to 12 literacy in the disciplines of history, social studies, science, and the technical areas. Additionally, and you can look all this, uh, we will make sure we get the sites, but if you just Google Common Core State Standards, we'll bring you to the next slide. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and at, on that site, we'll the, nine, the National Go oh. That's the video we're going to watch. Governors Association and the count. Council of Chief State School Officers launched an effort. That's okay. <laughs> to come up with one set. I was just happy that I was not the one that had to navigate the video because we have to like at a certain time, and I was like, what if I get it at the wrong spot? Um, the three appendices are useful and very informative. Appendix A includes a lot of the information about the different categories of the standards. So in ELA, and we're going to see the clip, it will reiterate what I'm going to tell you. The standards for literacy are organized as reading standards, writing standards, speaking and listening standards, and language standards. Under the reading standards, there are three categories reading literature, reading informational text, and foundational reading skills. Those foundational reading skills specifically address those skills students need in kindergarten, first and second grade to become readers, okay? So now what we're going to do is we're gonna watch a clip that reiterates some of the organization of the standards, and you'll hear from two of the authors of the Common Core State Standards as well. Participate as a full member of our democracy is scarce and limited. In 2009, the National Governors Association and the Council of Chief State School Officers launched an effort to come up with one set of standards for all states. The Common Core State Standards were released in June 2010. More than 40 states have now agreed to replace their English and math standards with the Common Core by 2014, 
when new state assessments are expected to be introduced. Susan Pimentel, a consultant and standards expert, and David Coleman, who founded the education think tank Student Achievement Partners, led a team of about 70 teachers and experts who spent a year writing the new standards for English language arts and literacy. They are broken into four main content categories, reading, writing, speaking and listening, and language. Each section begins with something called the College and Career Readiness Anchor Standards, broad standards defining what kids should know and be able to do to be successful in college and on the job. These standards correspond one-to-one -one with the specific content standards that follow. We've heard from teachers around the country that have been looking at the standards that it keeps the focus for them about what it is they're preparing students for. So even if I'm a third grade teacher, um, wow, I have a, a role to play here in preparing students for college and for readiness. So there's a place that will really keep the focus on where it is I'm heading and what it is I'm preparing my students for. The content standards begin with that most fundamental of skills, reading. The anchor standards here emphasize reading closely, making logical inferences, citing specific textual evidence, and reading complex texts. A key concept, experts say, we have not been getting right in the classroom. What's been happening is that the reading that we've been asking students to do all the way along and in high school has begun to go down, but the reading that we ask our students to do um, in college and then if they get into their careers has actually stayed steady or gone up, and the difference is wide. Another big shift in the reading standards, more nonfiction. Experts say that while literature, like fiction and poetry, is important, kids must also be reading informational texts. When you look at what students actually read, what we read as adults and when we graduate um, and are on careers and, and jobs and just in life, is about 80% of what we read is informational text. Students need to be able to read tactical writing, as well as historical and scientific writing, as well as literature and literary writing. It's for this reason that there are two sets of reading standards across all grades, reading literature and reading informational text. Things like essays, news articles, and historical documents. By fourth grade, at least half of students' reading should be informational, and by high school, at least 70%. And the responsibility for teaching all this doesn't fall well, just on English teachers. The standards call for literacy and writing to be taught across all disciplines, history, social studies, science, and technical subjects. There is no way we will break the barrier of eighth grade reading scores in this country being flat for decades unless science and history teachers are full partners in demanding that students read and write to gain knowledge in their disciplines. 19th century European imperialism in Africa resulted... David Riesenfeld is a social studies and history teacher at Robert Widener High School in Queens, New York. He started working with the Common Core Standards for Literacy as part of a citywide pilot. We're looking at how to work specifically on kids reading more complex texts. So we started by looking at the concept of uh, finding textual evidence in primary and secondary sources. To prepare for today's history class, a debate on European imperialism in Africa, his 10th graders studied photos and illustrations from an eyewitness book on Africa, read an essay by 16th century social reformer Bartolome de las Casas, and read excerpts from the novel Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe, a complex text recommended in the standards appendix. Riesenfeld now assesses all his class readings with a text complexity rubric developed through the pilot. There's a heavy component in these standards that try to address the things that kids are going to need to know as they walk into any aspect of life. Anywhere from the auto mechanic to the university professor, we're going to have to look at how kids can take information that they're presented with, whether it's a manual or an academic text, and, and understand how, what to do with it. The ability to read... Areas to gain information. So I'm going to welcome up Mr. Laverde back to the stage. Listen, I was like, wait a minute, I saw you come up for math, and I was like, I thought she was coming up for ELA, and then I will revisit you and share the park assessment and example of a pro's constructive response. All right, so I'm going to be kind of talking about um, some of the text complexity and the activities that we're, we are having the students do in the classroom. Um, so first thing that I want to explain to you is what is close reading? Um, this is the, what we're having students do in our classes now. Um, close reading is defined as careful and purposeful reading and rereading of a text. 
to uncover layers of meaning that lead to deeper comprehension. Um, students will reread passages several times. And each time the students reread, they are rereading for a different purpose. Um, so how, what does one of these lessons look like? Um, the first thing that we do is we tell the students what are, learning, what are the learning targets for the day. Um, these learning targets set the purpose um, for the lesson, um, and they clarify what the students will learn and what they will need to do in the lesson. Um, previously, in how we used to teach reading, like we did with math, we gave them all the information that they needed up front. Um, we front-loaded them with unknown words that they would come across. Um, we gave them background information, and we pointed out different text structures um, in order for them to process the text. Um, in close reading, teachers want the students to be able to figure out unknown words on their own or through um, the content of what they're reading. They want, we want them to think critically and pick up on the structures of the writing or the text on their own. Um, so an example of a learning target that we had at some point um, with these lessons that we're doing, we're doing um, actually a module on Love That Dog. Um, I don't know if anybody's read that book, but it's a book about poetry um, and a little boy's experience with writing poetry and um, he didn't like it at the beginning and how he learns about it and how he um, starts to understand it a little better. So one of an example of a learning target is I can explain what Jack understands about poetry based on details from Love That Dog. So they have to go into they'll have to go into the text and find evidence to support their thinking. Um, the next part of the lesson is to engage the readers. Um, this part of the lesson gets the students interested and excited about what they are going to be learning. Um, so again, we, teachers will probe them with questions. Um, one of the questions that we talked about, <clears throat> excuse me, in my classroom is, what makes, a poem, what makes a poem a poem? Or what inspires writers to write poetry? Students actually, my fourth graders really surprised me with the answers that they come up with. We would make an, an anchor chart um, and record their answers on the, the chart paper, and we refer back to it um, every now and then during the lesson. So in the close reading, in one activity, we're going back to the same section three or four times in rereading the same section. Again, each time we're reading it, we're reading it for a different purpose, it, purpose and we might be reading it a different way. Um, so for example, in the first read, um, I might read to the students pages one through five, and they need to be following along silently. Um, the purpose of this reading is to compare poetry and prose. So poetry writing and then prose is just um, writing in paragraphs and complete sentences. Um, then I ask them the question, um, how is Love That Dog written? compared to Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing, which was another read aloud that we were doing in class at the time. What I did is I put two, um, I put both, one page of each book on the document cam and showed it to the kids. And they could actually see, oh, this one's, um, the poetry is written in shorter lines. The um, prose is written in complete sentences. Again, I didn't give them that information up front. They came to that conclusion on their own. The second read, um, maybe the kids will read the passage all together. Um, and this per the purpose of this reading would be for the students to think about what the passage is about. What is the summary of these pages? Um, they need to come up with the gist of what those pages are about. Then the third read, um, they would reread the section independently this time. And the purpose of this reading would be to find evidence from the text to support what they thought the summary was about. So for instance, there's an example on the handout if you have it. Um, one example is maybe the summary statement for pages one and two, where Jack doesn't want to write poetry. Okay, You made that statement. How do you know? Go back into the text and find that. Um, 
In one point, it says, Jack says only girls write poetry. So they had to go find that in the text. Um, and we also talk about the difference between uh, paraphrasing and using direct quotes from the text. So students start using that in their writing as well. Uh, the next part of the lesson would be to analyze another piece of poetry. Students um, were then asked to read a poem called The Red Wheelbarrow. Um, the teacher reads the poem out loud to the students as they follow along silently, just so they can get the gist of what the poem is. And then the second time, um, I would reread them the poem, and they had a, a purpose this time for the, for the reading, which was to think about what Jack learned about, about poetry from reading The Red Wheelbarrow. Um, after rereading, the students would complete a worksheet um, that is in your handout. For the first time, we kind of walk through each step with them. Um, but it's amazing now when I put a worksheet in front of them like this, they do it completely on their own. They know what, um, what evidence is. They know how to infer now. They know how to synthesize information. Um, They've really blown me away with how much, how far they have come. Um, just a quick side note. Um, reading strategies like inferring and synthesizing, before we used to teach in three or four week units. Um, and these concepts would have been taught through read alouds or mini lessons and guided reading. Um, the way that we're doing close reading now, this is all embedded into our everyday teaching. Um, and the students are getting a lot out of it. And then to wrap up the lessons every day, um, you go back to the learning targets and students basically grade themselves. Five if they really understood, zero, uh, one or zero if they weren't really getting it and maybe need a little more help. Um, and that helps just to show their mastery towards the standards. So that is what close reading looks like in fourth grade. Awesome. Thank you. Sure, at some point. But what it does for teachers is it really gives them a sense of where students should be performing, what skills and strategies they need at that particular grade level. And it also gives you a way to assess the students that you have and where they are in terms of where they should be. So I'm just going to instruct you now to guide you to look at the handout that says Pro's Constructive Response. Last year, certain schools or school districts piloted the CARD assessment. We will, in Massachusetts, be administering the CARD throughout the district, throughout the state. Am I getting confused? My district's big. That's why I'm thinking it's almost like, like a state. Wakefield is implementing the CARD this year. For, they are, for definite. For right. Three day are implementing the CARD. Yeah. So, there's a lot of anxiety around what is this, right? This is the unknown. Um, and so what I have here for you is a question from the sample test, which you can access online. And I gave you the website there in case you want to peruse the site. You could even take the test yourself. 
um, for grades three and up. Obviously, we're not, we don't have testing in K1 and 2, um, standardized or standards based assessment like the PARC or the MCAS. On the front page, it explains the window of when the test will be, and then Wakefield already has, I believe, identified when the dates exactly will be. There will be two assessments. There's going to be a PBA, performance based assessment, that will happen first, and then there's an end of the year assessment. On the end of the year assessment, it will only be um, computer, if, are you guys taking a computer or paper or pencil? I won't get too into that right now. I'm not going to get into it. At any rate, the end of the year assessment will be multiple choice or um, this new type of multiple choice where you have to answer part A and part B. At the PBA, the performance-based assessment, students will be expected to write responses to reading. There are three types of these responses to reading. They are listed there. One is a literary analysis, one is a narrative, and the other is research simulation. What I've done is I've pulled out the eighth grade literary analysis question, and that question directly matches a standard. I've also pulled out the standard. And then I pulled the standards K, 8 that are aligned to that standard. It's standard 6. So I'm going to give you just a few minutes to look through the progression of that standard in light of the question that's being asked at the eighth grade level, and then take just a few minutes to talk to someone next to you about what you notice about the progression of that particular standard, which is standard six. So things that you notice, I know we've been standing and talking at you for a long time. Um, things that you notice about the progression of the standards or even the question and its alignment or connection to, a particular, to that particular standard. This is not to say there aren't other standards that are being addressed with this question, but that one is one that really stands out. Any other thoughts? Yes. Just looking at the verbs, 
in the standard because I looked at the progression and helped me really see how that works developmentally. First name that I identified and acknowledged it was the distinguished parent capacity survivability. Just looking at those verbs makes it very clear. Excellent point, right? You get to analyze, which is a much more complex skill than just identifying <coughs> or naming. Any last thoughts? Thank you. Thank you, Liz. So I, I hope that activity in the, in the presentation helped, helped uh, shed some light on English language arts as well. Uh, at this point, we want to give you plenty of time to ask questions, talk about uh, the Common Core a little bit more, either in math or ELA or both. So we thought the best way to do that is to go into a breakout session into the small cafeteria, which is right across the hall. And you'll notice that there are six uh, tables kind of spread out. So that, and, uh, and I'm asking the administrators to break into teams, as we discussed the other, the other day. Uh, you can either locate your building principal if you'd like to, uh, to talk to someone specifically, or you can move out to any of the tables. Um, we will have the math teachers sitting together at one table labeled math, if you have math specific. Uh, questions, and this hopefully this will give you a chance in a small group setting to ask the questions that you'd like to uh, ask and maybe talk about some of the things that are on your mind. So as we do that, we'll be there for about a half an hour uh, to have a small group discussion, and uh, I hope that you'll find it very helpful. So thank you so much for your participation, and hopefully we'll see you right across the hall. Thank you. Thank you.